And Ben Gorham, the founder of Byredo, probably the coolest beauty and accessory brand there is. Um, before we start the discussion about uh, our theme, I would like to give a little bit of um, context. So maybe we'll start with how you started this magazine and what the idea behind it is and why this is so dear to you. Well, it kind of started in a very organic way and a little bit spontaneous. I had a friend in Austria that had a magazine. And he asked me for, for help in his fashion department and because it wasn't looking too great. And I, at the beginning I said, oh, maybe not. And then I actually agreed and I produced a few shoots for the fashion part. And then it came out really, really good. And I said, I kind of don't want to give it to you because your layout sucks. So I ended up changing his layout, changing his writers. And I kind of flipped the magazine completely. And I realized that I really enjoyed the process and that somehow I kind of knew how to do certain things. And that's when it hit me that during all these years of modeling, I was observing and learning, not kind of being conscious completely that I was doing that. And I, I felt so good about it. And I realized that I want to put something out there that represents a part of me. Um, also, I wanted to make something because, you know, as a model, you're a part of someone else's vision. It is creative, but to a certain extent, um, you know, you're, you're part of the vision of the photographer, of the creative director. And I thought I'm, I would love to put something out there that, that kind of represents me and the woman um, of my age, my generation. I wanted to do a print that is comes out once a year because I thought that's, in my mind, that's the turn of magazines that's going to happen. It would be more about the print. It would represent something, a time in, represent an issue or a subject that is connected to the times that we live in. And then invite a lot of people on board to collaborate on that subject, on that issue and explore it. Um, so I knew it's gonna come out once a year. It's gonna be a collective item I love print, so I wanted the print to be very, very unique. And that's how it started. I mean, a lot of my references were magazines from the 60s when it comes to graphic design and also, also subjects and also late 60s. And what I also realized is that what I loved about those magazines is the approach to femininity, to sensuality, to nudity, that back in the day was very, very innocent, very, very natural, and somehow I, I saw that nowadays you kind of miss that approach, that either the, um, the approach to, to body and is either very, very vulgar or very prude. So somehow we lost that innocence. And I thought that would be really interesting to somehow introduce in the magazine so that there is always that erotic, erotic twist. And in general, the magazine kind of focuses on the subject that we pick per issue. But also, um, you know, when I invite um, contributors on board, we also do profiles on them, on their work. I want it to be basically a book that is very, very inspiring and um, more on people, not current, not dependent on trends, something that will be um, timeless. Mm -hmm. So the first issue, for example, is since I was really focused on the side of interpretation of femininity, I realized that in the fashion industry, there's this was six years ago, that there isn't that many women photographers. And I thought that the first issue should be de dedicated to women photographers. And it's funny because it's an industry mainly directed towards, towards women. So I invited a lot of very, very incredibly talented women and photographers from the industry. You know, from Annie Leibovitz, Sarah Moon, to, to you know, Ellen von Unruh, Ines, to shoot for the magazine and show, present to us their interpretation of sensuality and, and, and erotica. And then the second issue was also very woman-based. It was called um, The Woman is Present. And we focused on artists that are inspirations for designers and designers, women designers, that have started their own brands or are heads of, of major brands. So we explored that. We spoke also to Marina Abramovic there and her you know, um, collaboration with um, Ricardo Tishi, and also about all her work and her approach to, again, sexuality and sensuality, because that's always somehow the subject that comes around. And then the third issue was around narcissism, because like Jefferson Hack yesterday said, you know, we live in times of me, 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 me. And this was, you know, two years ago. So we explored that subject. And the most recent one from last year is around five senses. 
Um, a little bit on your background then. Um, how did Barreto come about? I think your background is not really in fragrances. No, not at all, actually. Uh, mo most of my life, I was an athlete. Funny enough, I played basketball. Uh, and uh, when that failed, I went back to school to study art in Stockholm. Um, and upon graduating, I, made a, I met a perfumer for the first time in my life uh, and had um, a very interesting conversation about the uh, creative possibilities of smell. Um, and this idea fascinated me, you know, coming from uh, a more of a visual training background, to be able to um, hear about the possibilities of something that was so invisible. Um, so I engaged in a creative project um, where I translated specific memories into smells. And it was smells for a very long time. It later became you know, a commercial product as perfume. Um, but I had this idea that most people, without knowing the physicality of it, for me, smell was very much about memory. Uh, and I used these smells to communicate specific memories from, uh, from my background. Uh, and then I created something that I uh, defined as a collective memory. Because I had, even though these smells that I created were completely subjective and personal, uh, I needed to find a way to get people to engage and try them. Uh, and then I created what I call the collective memory. Um, an, an example would be uh, one of the first you know, smells that I made was the way I remember my father smelling. Mm -hmm. uh, this was very specific to myself um, and probably didn't smell like your father, but, uh, but I felt most people could relate a father figure in their life to a smell. Uh, and this was enough to get people to engage with these smells that I was putting together. Um, it was qu quite naive to start, um, very art schoolish, uh, but this interest uh, grew into this obsession uh, and I decided to create a commercial vehicle to be able to do it full time. Uh, and that became uh, by Rito, a, a brand that would make products that I felt people use. Uh, like perfumes and so on. Yeah, I can imagine that the that the approach and also the introduction into the market is not the easiest because um, fragrances is generally a very difficult market and even a lot of really big designers are sort of fighting their teeth off of the idea of introducing their perfumes. And as an independent label, it's even a different kind of approach now. Yeah, well, luckily I didn't understand anything <laughs> in the beginning. So f for me, it was, again, it was quite naive uh, it, it was just a, an avenue for me to explore uh, these ideas. So, so I, s you know, I, I live in Sweden, with you know, an isolated city in northern Europe, with uh, virtually no perfume culture or uh, market. Um, so I started going back and forth to France to, to figure out the practicalities of, of making these products. Um, and it took me a while, but but I also saw that the uh, when I did start to look at the industry, uh, it really behaved as an industry and not an art. Uh, and, and that's, I think, where uh, we were able to push forward, is uh, we focused on, uh, on the smells mm -hmm. uh, and, and the products and, and the perception of them, as opposed to the marketing uh, and distribution. But it's interesting what Ben said, that he started from a very naive place because that's the same place that I actually started. I mean, I did have some experience, but from the other side. But I really had no clue about publishing. I really had no clue about making a magazine. And the way the magazine has been made, and still is, is in a very almost homemade way. You know, the team is really two people. It's me and another person. And then all the other people that are involved are just contributors. I mean, you wrote for the third issue, so, so you know really, really well. But that's kind of the beauty of doing projects where you just jump in for the experience, that you don't analyze it. It's not a strategy. It's not about making money. It's just through passion and through this amazing intuition that you just go for it. And then very, very often out, out of those kind of projects that you just do for love, 
something beautiful comes out, you know, later on in years. And I think that's really interesting that we kind of come, it's not like I went to, um, you know, a, a university where I learned special, you know, graphic design and, and, and went from there. It was completely spontaneous. And you can imagine, I mean, you know, um, a blonde model making a magazine, my expectations were so, I mean, everyone's expectations were at the beginning so low, so it was really easy to kind of shock them a little bit that it actually looks not bad. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's probably a little bit easier for you to prove yourself than it is for somebody else because the expectations are not that high. Exactly. <laughs> that's a, that's a little plus. I think with expectations, I mean, it's nice yeah. to hear that it was easier than you thought. For me, I felt it was very difficult, especially yeah. when I got to the industry aspect of it because it was a very traditional French uh, and Italian heritage. Most perfumers and people in the industry uh, possessed some level of pedigree, their father and their grandfather, and you know, so there was a really strong, you know, heritage to the industry. So, uh, so I was actually, even though uh, I'm sure the expectations of a basketball player <laughs> creating <laughs> smells was absurd go. to most people, I found it extremely uh, difficult in the beginning because it was such a closed circle. Mm -hmm. uh, that had been run in, in a very specific way for so many years. Yeah, and I guess the difference is also a little bit that you didn't have the public attention straight from the beginning well, when you started yeah, I'm already. Not, I was never popular. <laughs> 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 um, let's talk a little bit about this issue and the topic and the theme of Five Senses. Why did you pick this? Well, I actually, I produced and created my own fragrance. Um, I, I started working on it uh, a few years ago and that's where I kind of started to be interested in the, you know, the power of the sense of smell, how, it, as Ben said, can really put you in a state of mind or take you back into a memory or take you back to a person, um, you know, the presence of, of, of someone in the past. And that was just an introduction to studying senses and, and their incredible power because, you know, everything that we know about the world comes to us through the receptors of five senses. You know, from the day we are born, you know, we take a, a sip of cold air, we, our mother wraps us in a blanket, holds us next to our warm body, we've, you know, learned the idea of, of comfort, and I just found it being really, really inspiring. And especially, you know, two years ago, there was this whole trend of, of living in the present moment, living in the now, but the really, the only way to live in the present moment is actually to focus on your five senses, because that's how you feel the world uh, that is surrounding you in the, in, in the present moment. And later on, someone gave me a book called um, Stranger in a Strange Land. And it was, it's a science fiction, basically, novel from the 60s by Robert Heinlein. But it was really interesting because, I mean, the, the whole theme is, I mean, the whole story is quite crazy because it's a, it's, there's a expedition where they send um, the spaceship into, you know, into Mars actually, and they leave behind this, this one boy survives, and then 20 years later they do another expedition and they bring that boy back onto Earth. And he's really surprised by the way how we live, how we are disconnected from our body and from our senses, and he's very in tuned. And the way he perceives the world and the information that he gathers through the fact that he's very, very focused on his body reactions and all little tiny stimulations um, is quite fascinating. And that's, that's when I thought, okay, I think I'm on the right path. I think this is a really interesting subject to touch, especially nowadays where we are so distracted. We're over here, over sea, over touch, and we're really not focused on how we feel, how 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 we perceive the world very often is you know we're told how to perceive the world and then I, I thought it would be really interesting to speak to a lot of people a lot of artists and see how they create their art um, what senses they rely on most um, and you know if that even has a big influence on, on, on creating their, their their pieces so that's how I started to um, invite different artists, you know, from Daniel Arsham, who I thought was really interesting because he's colorblind mm -hmm. and his approach to that and, and how that influences his work. Um, I thought it would be incredible to invite Ben Gorham because of his, you know, relation to um, and fascination by the sense of smell. And when we met and we started 
started to talk about the project. It's quite funny because when we first met, I originally wanted to do five books in one box, and I wanted to dedicate each book to, to one sense. And once I started working on, on, on the magazine, I realized that you cannot separate the senses. It's impossible because one kind of stimulates the other or, or you know, it's so intertwined. You cannot really, that, that's impossible, that's unnatural. So I, it ended up being one book. And when I met with, with Ben and we started to talk and he mentioned this amazing project that he did with Carson Holler, that kind of blew my mind. And but I'm gonna let him tell you about it. And that's kind of, again, when I thought, okay, this is a really good subject. It kind of is very connected to the times that we, that we live in. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's worth the exploration and the whole journey. Yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about the two stories that you contributed to the magazine and also the background story of your project yeah. that you did with Carsten Heller. Yeah, and the second story, basically, I asked him to speak to an olfactory scientist, Gail Knowles, who's an incredible artist. She did many different projects, including creating the, the fragrance of, you know, this, the smell of the Wall Street crisis, which is insane. So she took into consideration everything that happened in that room you know, from the sweat to all the chemicals that body releases under stress, to the sweat on cotton, the smell of cotton, the smell of, you know, heated um, computers, paper, and she created this this amazing project. I mean, she's done a lot of things, but I thought it could be interesting to bring Ben and her together, and her have them just you know brainstorm and have this incredible, you know, conversation about all the stimulations on uh, connected to smell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think with the conversation with Gaia was, uh, was very interesting because she's extremely uh, experienced uh, and, uh, and, and quite technical, so her, her perspective uh, in regards to smell, I even though I would describe the obsession equally, yeah, is, is very different from mine. So, so that conversation I found quite interesting that um, her perception changed and, and she had a she really had a, a much bigger idea about how smell affects us in the world. Um, uh, whereas mine has so far you know, been much more self-indulgent uh, as a form of expression. That's okay, that's okay, should we live in, yeah. should we live in. As, as, <laughs> as Jefferson told us. Uh, but uh, I think I've you know, been open for, this, open for this form of collaborative work in smell partly because I had no background, and because I still believe that smell is completely subjective. So uh, even in you know, the commercial work that I've done, I've been able to invite um, photographers and, and artists um, and creative directors in to, to add a dimension or a facet to what I do. Uh, and it's, it's uh, interesting because most people, and this is probably true for this room as well, people have an idea about smell. Uh, people seldom think about it, uh, but uh, if I were to ask the people in this room, people would be able to say that I have smells and associations and likes and dislikes. Um, so as I engaged in these different dialogues, I found that very interesting, and it, it really added uh, a level of depth to what I was doing. So, um, so in, in terms of the, the project I did with Karsten Holler, um, uh, who, who's actually a friend uh, who I met many years ago, and, and an artist that I, you know, really um, admired um, for his uh, his focus on experience and, and that part of emotion. Uh, but uh, Karsten was a a scientist for 20 years, so he also had a very technical, specific approach to to even the art projects. Uh, and it turned out that he had a degree in uh, human scent communication, so there was a common denominator. Um, and I had a, uh, I had an idea one night watching the TV, and I don't know if this runs in Turkey, but it was a very traditional um, advertising film on TV about Vicks Vapor Rub, which is what you rub on your, your chest when you have a cold. And there's an illustration of the vapors entering into the nose and then through the body and then out somewhere else. And I started to think about um, my work, which was about evoking emotion through smell uh, and wondering about uh, the possibilities 
of doing this while people sleep. Uh, so uh, essentially controlling dreams. Uh, and I, uh, I couldn't think of a better person to develop this with than, than Karsten. So I called him uh, and he kind of dismissed it and then he called me back the next day and he said, I, I dreamt about it and it works. We should do it. Um, and we started, um, which was more of research in relation to sleep and sleep patterns, um, and ended up creating um, a toothpaste that you brush your teeth with before you go to bed that controls your dreams. Did it work? It works. It's amazing. Mm. Describe it a little bit. I mean, when you try it out for yourself, it's I've like been what trying it uh, for all the guests of the Soho House for the last two you, days. You put it in the little in the little toothpaste. Yeah. Well, it's it's uh, uh, we created we, in the research we found that men, women, and even children sleep and dream in different patterns. So, as we constructed these formulas, um, we decided to have an activator, which was this the active ingredients that that triggered the dreams, uh, and then allowed people to, to choose um, male, female, or infantile uh, in terms of a direction. Even the idea of combining these to tailor your dream experience. Um, and uh, I could see by some of the faces just telling people about the, uh, the possibility of me controlling your dreams with toothpaste is quite scary. Some people find it funny, but quite scary, uh, but physically possible. Uh, and this was the exploration experience of this project with Karsten. Karsten. But I have to say that the whole piece, how we, how we approached it, because we wrote about this project and, and we kind of covered it, but also I wanted to have this very loose conversation between Ben and, and Karsten. <laughs> and um, I said, Ben, can you can we arrange that? And he says, yes, I'm going to record it and I'll send it to you and we can, you know, transcribe it. And then he, <laughs> he's a few days later, a few weeks later, I get, um, I get the material. And basically you have two incredibly, incredibly creative people in one room speaking together, talking drinking. and drinking. So <laughs> the conversation went into so many different fields. I mean, it was amazing. It was completely cuckoo. I mean, it was completely insane. And I was sitting on, you know, listening to it, and, and I gave it to a person to transcribe it, and they're like, are you sure you want to transcribe this? It doesn't make any sense. I'm like, I know, just, just do it. And the editing process was really, really interesting. But it, it kind of was fascinating how far they went in their conversation. They were out of Earth around into the galaxy and back with everything. I, th I think, yeah, and it may have been a bit long. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, but uh, I how long did you guys actually talk and record? I I don't know if it was a day or a few days or lunch or it's kind of a blur. Uh, I just remember that we so sent somebody it transcribed it for like a week, it w <laughs> a it month, a month. <laughs> it, it was, and then, it, but I I think what was interesting with for me in in this uh, even you know just having this conversation is uh, I'm not an artist, so working with an artist. Um, I was able to, to learn or understand a little bit about how different the, the narrative is from what I do, which is uh, commercially focused. Uh, and the, I think the best way to sum it up is that I work trying to create products that is very clear and understandable to people. So uh, I want people to see uh, and engage and then ultimately buy. Uh, what I found with Karsten was that there was a there was a very defined distance to understanding work, uh, and that a lot of his experiences was created uh, amongst the viewers uh, uh, in a very undefined way. So um, it was very interesting for me, and even commercially, me trying to distance myself from this total clarity, which is consumer goods mm -hmm. uh, today. So. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for you know the project and and the issue, but um, being able to contribute and, and work with two very talented uh, artists has been amazing. 
When you talk about the effect that um, and the engagement that Kassel Hollers art has on people and how they interact with it, is this something that you think about as well when you're creating perfumes? And is it different when you create a perfume, like a scent for somebody and a scent of somebody's home and what you want to trigger in people and how they're supposed to live with it? Yeah, I, I think I draw some uh, differentiation on how I scent space and and people. I never, you know, I don't want to smell like my couch. This is, I had this idea, so uh, I saw a distinction in those two, but uh, oddly enough, uh, it's, it's seldom, I often get the question, you know, who's this fragrance for? Or mm -hmm. describe this woman. And, and it is uh, rarely that. It's rarely a person. It's still very um, intimate. And, and uh, sometimes more of a notion than something that tangible as, as, as making a fragrance for a person. So, and, I, and I think partly that as an industry, it has been sold as maybe a fashion accessory. And it, it, this is why you've seen the association of you know, designers making perfume, which really is, is, there's no more logic to that than architects having smells. Mm -hmm or dancers having smells. Of course. So, so, the, so, I, so I think it was uh, commercially, it was angled in that way to use it as an accessory. Um, but then it, it's also changed, I think, it, the function has changed. What, what's allowed me, I've been doing this for 10 years, uh, and, and what's allowed me to exist and grow and develop is that um, the product had really taken a back seat in this market. Mm -hmm. It, it was very much about marketing and brand. Uh, and my experience of going to an airport was that everything smelled the same. Uh, and when I asked the perfumers why this was, they said that, oh, there's some unique ideas in this, uh, but uh, when they're done, they add another 70 or 80 raw materials on top. So that every, so it's the perception of soup. And that's how we describe it. So, uh, so we gained a lot of um, interest by just creating clarity mm -hmm. to very simple, beautiful raw materials. In your editor's letter, you're speaking about the desensitization. Uh, you, you talk about desensitizing your, uh, that we're desensitizing our senses. Um, can you talk a little bit about the concept of like, you know, like how, like what you meant by that and how we can see this in our society? Well, I think uh, we, we live in the world where everything is incredibly fast and it's very, very fast paced and we don't really have the time to, to, to feel the present moment as I said before so kind of focus on 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 our senses what do you feel how does this feel you know close your eyes for a second what you hear everything is really really fast so I think also through you know the way we function the way we communicate nowadays which is very often through you know electronics or electronics where fonts and, and computers email it also kind of blocks the relationship relation that you have with another person when you would be there both in the same place so you kind of don't see them you don't smell them you don't you don't feel them in a way so i guess th all those kind of experiences are suddenly cut out and because they're cut out we kind of become a little bit immune to them and we become less sensitive to to different simulations and we just don't pay attention and i think um it's it's really funny because like I said at the beginning, these are you know our biggest primal teachers, and if we could go deep into, you know, exploring that and actually sharpening our senses, we could um, find out much more about the world we live in, and even pick up on different things from other human beings that we kind of completely ignore. So it's this huge source of knowledge that we kind of just, you know, ignore. And going back to fragrance, it's quite interesting because when I started creating my fragrance, what I, what I wanted to do is, of course, I've been I've been the face of many different fragrances of brands, but it wasn't really me. I would embody the vision of the designer, embody the vision of the brand. And when I decided to do something, I, I, I wanted to basically put out a piece of me, or as I said, you know, kind of my generation of women out there, and I wanted to connect, I wanted to try to connect a fragrance to some kind of statement or a, a thought. And I thought that is, it is very, very possible that 
if I basically when you get the, the bottle, when you get the fragrance, there's a manifesto inside and there's a message uh, from me or, or basically um, a few sentences. And I thought that if a young girl or a woman connects to that message, later on when she wears the fragrance and maybe she smells it on herself, it kind of triggers that kind of boost or that memory aspect to that message. And the message was basically about you know, woman empowerment. I think we, we live in times where there's so much expected from us, but at the same time, everyone around us is telling us how to be, how to live, how to look, what to wear, that it's really difficult to find your own identity in all of that. So basically, the message was just, it's called original. The idea was that it basically kind of encourages girls to, to follow their own intuition, their own instinct, not just blindly follow a path that is laid, laid down for them. So to kind of go inside and try to find out, which is very difficult, who you are. I mean, it takes years. The older you get, the, the more kind of you, you find out about yourself and the more comfortable you are in your own skin. But I thought it would be really interesting to kind of take that message, connect it with the fragrance, and if you know someone reads that and, and there's some kind of bond happening later on when they do wear the fragrance, it kind of stimulates them or gives them that little bit of courage. You also have, for your fragrances, there's also always uh, a little note with it. Um, what's the purpose of it? I, I think that I tried to create narratives that would, uh, would start the story for people, that would spark the imagination or open the sense. Right? Because uh, I think you talk about, you, you know, the, 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 the senses. I think smell is probably the forgotten sense. It's the one that is you know, closest connected to memory, uh, but the one we seldom reflect over. And I think, for me, the awareness of smell was extremely important. I think some people have described it, you know, when they read the book by Patrick Siskan, The Perfume, how, you know, following this, they smelt everything, good and bad. Uh, and, and I think it, it's just a, a, a level of awareness. So my idea with the narratives associated to the products is just to create some uh, level of awareness to open the sense for people. Talking about awareness and dealing with these kind of things, is like dealing with the five senses and dealing with it in such detail for this issue, did you in a way reclaim your own senses? Did I reclaim my own senses? Yeah, to some extent. You know, you say that like, you know, it's like we're desensitizing or whatever it is. Well, I uh, did, I have to say, well, because I've done a very big research and, and about every, you know, every aspect of the sense of smell and, and you know, there's a lot of things that I, had no idea about. Um, I, I yes, I became more more sensitive, and I, I pick up on things much. I just pick up on things I wouldn't pick up on earlier. And definitely, even working on the perfume, it kind of completely opened my sense of smell mm -hmm. to another level. Where I, you know, I kind of because when I was creating it, I st I started working with the nose, and and she before we sat down and we started to compose the fragrance. Um, she said, well, how do you want to do this? And I said, well, I kind of want to learn as much as possible before we go ahead. So for almost like seven, eight months, I would go to her every week when, or every twice a week sometimes and just sit next to her and watch her work. And she would be sitting there and say, smell this, smell this. What does this smell like? And then when she said, you know, are you ready? I'm like, well, yes, I'm ready. She said, so how do we do this? I'm like, well, I have a mood board because I'm very visual, so I brought in this mood board that I had for the fragrance, which was kind of interesting, the, the combination, you know, the translation of visuals into the scent. And there was a lot of, you know, Richard Meyer's work, and there was a lot of Robert Maplethorpe, Lilies, and a lot of actually fashion, George Bean. And she said, okay, this is great, but what, how do you translate that into fragrance? And I said, well, you know, that's, you know, the Richard Meyer, okay, that will be the design of the bottle, but you know, I wanted for a modern woman, so for me, there was a lot of element of unisex on the mood board as well. Um, and I said, you know, for me, unisex is green tea, and then, but I wanted for a woman that is, you know, I wanted the element of unisex because I think nowadays women have to be quite powerful and strong, and so that's the element, uh, but I want them still to be feminine, and I want the fragrance to be quite floral, and I was thinking about what way to go, and I looked at the mood board, and there were, you know, all these images of lilies of Robert Maplethorpe, and I said, I actually love lilies, and I love what it represents—that it's, 
you know, it seems so pure and innocent in shape, but it's incredibly erotic. It used to be, in all poetry, it used to be a sign of erotica. Um, and then, you know, and then I moved on and I said, well, I want something that connects with me personally because it's my, you know, my fragrance at the end of the day. And I remember my mother always using very, very woody smells. So that memory kind of came back and we ended up adding some woody, well, amber. And then we wanted a little bit punch. I kind of went off the subject, the question, right? <laughs> no, what was no, the no, question? No, you're fine, you're fine. I'm fine? Okay. Um, well, yes, all that, the whole journey. Um, again, this was a project that I kind of jumped on board not knowing much. And at the beginning, I, I, I started to work with a very big uh, company and I started to feel a lot of pressure that the fragrance was supposed to be pink and sweet and I don't consider myself pink or sweet. So I kind of decided I to do it on my own, completely crazy, not knowing anything from that side of the industry. But that's what I kind of love that about jumping into these projects without that much knowledge because on along the way you learn so much. Of course you make tons of mistakes, but you know, you come out of this experience so much richer and there's nothing worse in the world just than being static and not growing. And these projects kind of stimulate you and, and make you learn more and just, you know, grow. Is there also a visual component to the process of you creating your perfumes? Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I think there is... The, the process of you creating your perfumes? Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I think there is to, to most people, and that because we live in a very visual world. Um, I tried to not be too visual in the beginning. I, I worked with... Uh, objects that smelled, places, stories, poetry, music, uh, because at the end of the day it was, it's an emotional process, so you know, you set out to uh, connect with the perfumer who's actually mixing these raw materials, you need them to feel uh, what you're feeling, so it's, uh, so I, I, and still today use various tools uh, the difference was in the beginning I, I knew nothing about the technical aspects of perfume. So the process was uh, much more abstract. Um, today I understand enough about raw materials uh, and, uh, to be able to have a much more specific dialogue with the perfumer, which has simplified the process somewhat. How has the process changed to creating different products? I mean, you recently, you launched a, bag, a line of accessories of bags. You made a, uh, like some glasses, etc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th again, very commercial you know, project, but I tried to take our approach and process to creating you know, fragrance uh, and found that it applied to other categories, uh, if you want to say. Uh, it was also important for the, the brand because uh, I was starting to feel confined by uh, an industry uh, and, and my idea was never really to uh, be included in an industry so as I started to see that framework of you do beauty and you s your narrative should be beauty and you should do these products uh, I felt the need uh, to kind of offset that uh, so I opened a store in New York and um, and I started making uh, anything I felt like. Uh, and I was obsessed with leather for various reasons. So I, I uh, engaged in a, you know, a two-year project of uh, working with craftsmen in Italy to uh, translate, again, my ideas into, uh, this time, something much more physical, uh, which has been interesting. You also made a film, which I think was shown uh, right before we came out for this issue. How was the process of doing that? Because this is something that's new for you as well, no? Yes. Um, I had this idea because I started to focus on, on um, sensory memory and how powerful that is. And then when I went deep into you know, exploring senses, I realized also that the only action that kind of combines all five senses is actually sex. So I thought it could be quite interesting to combine sensory memory with, with that. And um, I thought it could be interesting to do a video where 
a girl has a very, very strong memory, kind of twisted around, um, where she has a very strong memory of something that happened. And the memory is so impactful that it stimulates her, stimulates all her senses. So the idea was that, you know, she's just sitting and then suddenly the memory comes and she's starting to, you know, her breath is starting to get heavier. She starts to get goosebumps on her skin. Her muscles are getting, you know, tense and eventually she click uh, at the beginning i didn't think of doing it myself but i had such a clear vision of how it should look like that i knew if i would get a director on board it would be hell for him because i would be standing behind him telling him exactly how to do it how to how to shoot it should look like that i knew if i would get a director on board it would be hell for him because i would be standing behind him telling him exactly how to do it how to how to shoot it so um i spoke with an amazing um DP and um, in New York and he I knew he could guide me because it was a very new something very very new to me and um, I could rely on him and uh, we did it. <laughs> you were talking again about um, the memories that are attached to senses. What sense do you feel like has the strongest memories attached to them? I think um, I would agree here with Ben that the sense of smell. It's funny because I was playing around recently and I was thinking, you know, how different things remind us of different people or, or situations in the past. You have a song that you listened to when you were in love with someone. And the moment the song comes up, you kind of go back in the past. And I was the same as with smell. And with touch, not as well, no, not as much. And then visually, of course, if you see certain things of someone or something of the past, you know, you c it kind of transfers you, transports you back as well. But I was trying to basically change that. So I had a song that I connected to someone very, very intensively. And on purpose, I started to play that song over and over in different times of the day, doing different things, so that I would kind of become immune to, to that connection. Because I actually liked that song and I couldn't listen to it anymore. <laughs> that w that's where it kind of came from. And I actually managed to do that. And I was trying to do the same experiment with smell, where there was a candle that I was associating to someone. And I kept on burning it in different times of the day, kind of bringing it with me so I'd have a different connection to that smell. And it, I couldn't kind of revert that. I mean, reset that. So I guess the most powerful, I would say, is the sense of smell. Also, smell is very unique because it's so connected to the sense of, of taste. The moment you, lo you lose your sense of smell, you lose your sense of taste. So it has, you know, it's very, very strong. Yeah, it's interesting. We talked about this, I think, a couple of days ago, um, how most people are losing their senses with time, but there's one sense that nobody's losing, no? Yeah, it's the sense of touch. It's actually the first one that is developed uh, uh, you know, uh, when you have a fetus and it slowly grows, that's the first sense that is developed. And it's this last sense to leave us. Because the older you get, you know, you, s you slowly lose a little bit, you know, the, your sight, your hearing, even, you know, your smell isn't as sharp. But the sense of touch kind of stays with you until, until the end. And it's also the biggest sense because it covers all of your body. Um. I think pretty much all of the products that the both of you, all of the things that you both of you create are sort of timeless and yet they have a modern approach to things. Um, is that approach that you did consciously? Like, is it, like, was this a conscious, appro uh, conscious approach to create something that's timeless but modern to some extent? Well, I don't like anything that's too current or too trend orientated. I think that's to be, um, I wanted to have more value. But going back to the touch, I just remembered something okay. we, that we spoke about, which was really interesting is mm, I wanted to have more value. But going back to the touch, I just remembered something okay. we, that we spoke about, which was really interesting is that I started to, to read a lot about how culturally, how, um, you know, in different cultures, you have a very different approach to touch, where in, you know, some cultures, it's very normal to be very, very, you know, physical with in, in the family, or um, uh, you know, some cultures you kind of keep that physical distance. And there was this one thing that was really interesting that um, I read that I thought it could be, you know, worth sharing is that, like for example, in Eastern Europe, um, the idea of 
touching you know someone that's older like your grand like grandmother or grandfather for a young kid they kind of it's basically kids are kind of pushed away from the grandparents in the way that you shouldn't be touching someone older because that person is older and then there's other cultures where you see you know kids massaging grandmas or massaging their feet as a as as a way to show respect and basically they did this whole research and they said that in those countries where the kids are kind of more accustomed with you know with uh, aging their whole aging process is much easier in their mind so they don't, their fear of death or aging isn't as strong as in other cu cultures where you kind of put that put that barrier between you know to even touch in that sense so that was really interesting. And then you have also, we spoke about infants, right, and mm -hmm. orphanages, that there are, you know, if babies are not touched and hugged, they die. So that actually explains really, really clearly how important that sense is, you know, that connection. And you know, once you told them, you touch them, it's not only the touch, it's also the smell and the temperature, the warmth. So that human connection through senses is, is is everything. That's what, you know, being human is all about. How but you asked that <laughs> different <laughs> question. <laughs> Sorry, um, Ben. No, no, no. It, uh, I'm listening. <laughs> I should partake. But <laughs> no, to, to you, you asked about aesthetics and about this idea of... Uh, yeah, I feel like in, the, in, the, in our times where everything becomes faster and faster, the timeless products are becoming more and more important to some extent. Yeah. It's it's a, it's kind of a frickle, you know, that idea of timeless. Everybody, I, I think it's become very popular because, uh, and, and what I I think it's probably more about is sustainable. Like people want to be sustainable. It, you, uh, they want to last. Mm -hmm. I think it's about lasting power. And but, uh, I think it was very popular, you know, years ago to be modern. People talk talk about being modern, you know, which doesn't really. Which I don't understand really as a as, as a concept, but I I I really uh, understood that uh, the the products that we were making needed to have relevance to people that live today. So it's it's really this idea of relevance has really been um, my focus, and and then um, timeless, which should suggest that um, this product uh, can have existed throughout the, the span of, of time. Um, and I don't think necessarily uh, my products do. I, I hope that they're, uh, without being involved in trends and, and all, uh, all these other notions, I hope that what uh, I create has relevance today and that uh, it has it tomorrow. And, and if it doesn't, then I will probably create something else. I think it's similar when you say contemporary art or who someone's a contemporary artist or it's I think any art, even art done, you know, sixty, seventy, a hundred years ago, if it has an impact on a person that is living in our times, on a contemporary um public, I mean it's contemporary. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I think I think by timeless or that's how I kind of if I would have to define modern as in the same way, it's basically something, a piece of art, or it could be a product that people were responding to in the past, but they respond to it now. It, something can be modern when, even if it was done a really, really long time ago. So I guess it's that connection, reaction, makes it modern. Does that automatically sort of influence the visual approach to the product as well? Because funnily enough, uh, both of you created, uh, or like, you know, it's like your visual identity and also the one from your perfume is very black and white and simple. And it, does that come with the concept of, uh, like, it must be influenced by it now? Well, yeah, maybe. I, it, well, you have to make a bottle and then you have to make a box. This is how you sell. Okay, well, you have to make a bottle and then you have to make a box. This is how you sell. Okay, I, I think I can do this. and and. I started, I needed to add, uh, again, it was about being relevant. And in my industry, relevance was, unfortunately, heritage. So when I looked at the heritage of perfume, uh, I saw Chanel. And I said, oh, they're black and white. Maybe that should be my relevance. I know, it sounds ridiculous, but I looked at Chanel. 
you know, who, you know, almost 100 years ago, kind of revolutionized um, the commercial industrial part of, of fragrance as a market. So it, for me, it's, you know, it's, uh, there's no genius in my black and white. <laughs> Uh, it, it's really that it w it, my process was very practical in uh, trying to create uh, a notion of relevance. Well, I looked at Ben's and I thought, he's <laughs> it's black and white. No, <laughs> no, no I'm kidding. Um, no, <laughs> the black and white came from the fact that the mood board was all black and white. Because I love black and white photography. And um, I also wear a lot of black and white. So that was just basically very simply that the mood board was just obviously black and white. Everything I would pin on there that I loved ended up being black and white, so it kind of made complete sense. And then the design of the bottle, I, I wanted to do something you know, very minimalistic. Um, there's a lot of people that create fragrance, a lot of celebrities that create fragrance, they're all really over-designed and crazy, and, 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 and I really wanted to move away from that because I don't kind of respond to that, so I also wait, went for a very structured um, minimalistic form and since Richard Meyer was a huge inspiration also on the mood board that's that's the only way I could go because it made sense in my head because I really didn't want it to become something that I don't believe in so I was really sticking to what I love what I like and just hoping people will connect with that rely rely well, that's that's a hard one in what sense? In any sense. I mean, you know, it's like in your everyday life. It's like, what do you feel is the most important for you? Well, I'm very visual, I have to say. Right. But then I started to pick up on the sense of smell really, really um, strongly. So um, when there's, there's, then there's hearing. I mean, I, I can't really pick, to be honest. Well, I would uh, maybe visual. I would, I would stick to visual, so sight. One of yours, so I'm not going to ask that. No, you don't, <laughs> I actually. I, I would say it's touch. How come? Um, I don't know. Maybe I was, uh, maybe I had a very safe childhood. <laughs> but <laughs> it, uh, I, I, it, for me, it's very important. Uh, smell is there, obviously, m more now than ever. It's a part of how I see things. Uh, but when I look at my life, and, and uh, I have children, I have family, uh, I, I think touch is extremely important. Uh, Which is also, I think, the most personal one, no? To some extent, the most personal sense is like... Uh, well, yes, because you have to come quite close to the person to smell them. <laughs> quite close? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends <laughs> how much perfume they use. Sometimes they walk into the room and you smell them immediately. But uh, it's, it's very intimate, I think, um, smell. I think definitely more than touch and definitely more than sight and hearing. Mm -hmm. Great. I think we're going to open up the um, conversation a little bit to you guys, where the microphones are and if there's any questions. Great. No question. <laughs> no question. Oh, there's one. There you go. Is there a microphone for the gentleman? Macedonia actually, so it's kind of mixed up. So when you go, when I was growing up in Macedonia, and I was also traveling to Poland also often, but uh, in some sense, uh, uh, in Macedonia, everything smells different. You walk on the street and it smells different, and in Poland, it smells different, everything. And now I came here to Istanbul, Turkey, and I was going somewhere, and I smelled the same smell, and it's very strong. Actually, yeah. The, yeah oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh. You should do that. Oh, you should answer that. <laughs> you, you have smelled it in other countries, you come to other countries and smell it. Well, it probably there's a lot of influence, I would say, logically uh, around that is, you know, connected to cooking spices in the air, the, the flowers are in bloom. But what was really interesting is that the, um, the olfactory scientist, Gail Nels, that Ben spoke to for the, for the issue, she actually created. She associated smells for every country in the world. 
and then she mixed those smells and created the um, the fragrance of the world. So I guess it is possible to a certain extent, but that was really really fascinating the project that she did. I think, you know, technically in perfume, I, I think what uh, people don't realize is that there's thousands of raw materials, both uh, natural, which come from nature, uh, uh, which are limited to what nature can give us. A and then what's really propelled the, the, the creative, you know, way forward is synthetic raw materials. And, and uh, synthetic raw materials can be created, um, you know, I could technically, create um, the smell of your sweaty socks. So yes, the city is, <laughs> is very doable, uh, but through the uh, evolution and development of synthetic raw materials. Thank you. Good luck. I think there's somebody down there. In my case, no compromise. I think this is the the luxury of being an you know independently owned company. Uh, is that uh, profits may not necessarily be uh, your f your first objective. Uh, so, uh, but I also tr try. I also uh, need to be honest in that uh, a part of my process now has become getting people to engage with these smells and I think I've uh, I do projects that are more extreme uh, I, I did a collaborative work with a, a duo from Paris called MM Paris a few years ago <laughs> and, and it, it's kind of I would probably define it as the, the most creative um, piece of work in this collection uh, and it smells like a block of um, Japanese calligraphy ink uh, and it's really that extreme. It, it, it disregards some of the structures of classic perfume, but it really is a smell. Uh, and I think some people um, like it, most people don't, unfortunately. Uh, but it's a very clear idea. And, and uh, I think that's the, that idea of clarity, that idea of somebody picking up a smell and um, whether they like it or not, be able to understand what it is has been um, extremely important to, to my process. What do you think of labels like from the Yasmin, for example, that try to sort of push the boundaries of scent so far with all of those sort of esoteric ingredients that they place in some of their scents, like the scent of wood shavings and washing drying on the line and all those things that can't really be? Yeah, no, I, th I, think, I think creatively uh, uh, it's exceptional because it, again, it disregards some... Uh, uh, what people don't understand is that uh, we have uh, likes and dislikes in terms of smell, but it's not genetic. So uh, uh, even this idea of male and female perfume is, is programmed behavior. This has been programmed to you by society and by marketing and, and big groups for many years. Um, and this is why the notion of women wearing flowers and men wearing woods exists. Uh, and this is very hard to, to, to break. Um, but uh, a brand like Com um, disregards the, the framework of an industry and I think it's uh, in line with their approach in fashion and, and Ray's kind of vision. So, so I think it's, uh, it's relevant it may not be the biggest commercial vehicle in fragrance, uh, but, uh, but s very strong creatively. Thank you. Thank you.
I was using Baldafri. Now I switched to uh, Mohave Ghost. I, I don't know, I pronounce it right. No, no, yeah. Mojave Ghost, yeah. Mojave Ghost. So I have the small size with me. Maybe you might to. Uh, I have the big one here, you want? Yeah. <laughs> they don't sell it in Turkey. I don't mind it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So maybe, do you mind signing it for me? Yeah, no that's, problem. That's my question after that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, for sure. Maybe I could add about the book 25 that, because we don't have it actually here to show, but also um, Ben has created this. Well, what we did is we wanted the book to be as much of a sensory experience as possible. So there's a lot of different textures of paper and um, visually it's very stimulating, then it's very minimalistic, so it's like a whole journey. And then Ben created this, um, well, we use one of your senses, smells, fragrances. Mm, or was almost. it created? Like it created. It was created especially for for twenty five, and we um, put in a bookmark inside, so the magazine also smells. Do, do you have the visuals of those bookmarks here? I don't think I, I, we were allowed to, to play it. Them? Yes. Well, because they're uh, very full on. Yeah. Well, I, Anya said uh, these bookmarks, these which were actually f cropped photographs. Um, of various things, most of them fruit. Yes. Uh, but the connotation of these images was very erotic. Uh, and I think she was testing me in terms of perception and, and smell. And, um, and that smell that you're describing I is largely based on a, a, a raw material called costas. Uh, and w what I found really interesting with this material is uh, in combination with flowers, it's quite beautiful. And I think we have the, the, the book is here, the, the, the issues here yes. at the store, so people can smell the bookmarks. But this raw material by itself smells like a goat, like an actual goat. So, uh, also to show that, uh, you know, a lot of the, the beautiful work in perfumery and the magic in this is the combination of raw materials. Uh, and it's not. Uh, entirely about white flowers. Yeah, somebody's coming with a microphone. Thank you. Uh, I hope I was not here late to understand about this, but I have this question that's where do you see the smell in art? Where do I see the art in smell what or the smell in art? I, th you know, I, I, I think it's becoming more relevant. I, I, uh, I'm not sure this type of panel and this type of discussion existed even 10, 15 years ago. So I think uh, we talked about it the other day, the, the level of awareness. I think as individuals and artists and look for new ways to communicate, uh, I think smell has become more important. I think somebody was uh, uh, talking about, you know, fourth dimension and uh, adding facets and dimensions to the way we perceive things. Uh, I think smell is a, a very important one. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's been entirely focused on a commercial industry uh, for many, many years. And I think it's becoming more of a, uh, a medium for people to express ideas and, and, uh, and thoughts. If you're interested in that, you should come here for a lecture with Miroslav Bauka because he actually takes senses and he gives senses a physical existence. And he actually takes smell and he mentioned actually, he, he created something where he uses smell as a sculpture's material. So he actually sculpts through smell. So I think it is very, very present in art. So uh, it's not something that create the smells that are exist and you uh, change them into the perfumes. Is that right, what I understand? Uh, no, I mean, sorry. Uh, like for yourself, I'm sorry. No, I no. usually go to the seminar and I usually don't read about your background because I want to see what your, uh, I mean, I want to just judge by the time I see the artist and I talk to them. So I'm just saying that in this uh, um, cultural event, 
uh, where is the place of your um, create, mm, creative uh, things you have done in this art, artistic uh, environment, you know? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, Sven. Okay, you <laughs> Sorry. That's uh, fine, it's fine. I will thanks. maybe yeah. ask you later. Yeah, yeah, feel so free. I, uh, so uh, why are you here? Uh, oh, is that what it? Why am I here? <laughs> Anya no, made me. Anya made me come. Answer. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, thank oh. you, everybody.